Man, it's good to see you. Let me invite you to take your Bibles if you brought a copy of the Scriptures with you and open with me to the book of Philippians in chapter 2. Philippians 2, we're going to begin in verse 19 this morning and go through the end of chapter 2. And hey, as you're turning there, would it embarrass you if I bragged on you for just a second? That wouldn't throw you off, would it? Some of you are like, yeah, brag, man, brag, brag. And uh, uh, several weeks before Christmas, uh, around Thanksgiving time frame, uh, we rolled out to you a huge, audacious Christmas offering goal and said, uh, man, we believe God's got us involved in four different key areas, and I really need you to dig deep. I really want you to give. And, uh, uh, and then we messed up the mailing, and it came late, and we thought, man, there's just, I don't know. I just don't know. I don't know. And I didn't give you an update last week because I was waiting on the final pieces to come in from the postal service. Y'all know we've got this thing called COVID running around, right? So it changes everything. And here's the final tally as of this week. You've probably seen it on your email, but let me just give it to you. As we close out the offering against a goal of $150,000, you gave $171,491.09. So (laughs) praise the Lord. Thank you for that. The... uh, fully funded all of those areas of uh, ministry, our compassion ministry, how we're going to touch real physical needs in our city and across our congregation, how we're going to uh, bring the city of refuge vision, bring the first phase of that, get it cranking across the street, how we're going to uh, uh, be able to continue to support our global partners and uh, in their work. Hey, you may not be able to, I may not be able to travel to South Asia, but we've got partnerships that we've been cultivating for years of people that, that we've been working alongside of who are still stepping into villages, are still taking food bags, are still meeting real physical needs and doing it with the gospel. And this week, if you're following any of that, this week we saw, I think, seven people baptized in one guy's field this past week. Just folks that have given their life to Christ because Christ followers gave sacrificially to bring the gospel to them so that that's what you're giving to and to take that fourth area and say to trust me when I say to you we don't know what city yet but we know God's going to give us a city and a church planter and allow us to come alongside the next preaching point to a city somewhere that right now is underserved with the gospel doesn't have representation of the church and we're going to be part of the ground floor of placing a church there so that Jesus' name is magnified among people you gave to that and I'm so grateful to you I can't tell you how overwhelmed I am at just how just how generous you are in your giving. So thank you for being who you are. Thank you for digging deep. Thank you for reaching and helping us be able to hit that goal. This is our goal, and God's allowed us together to be able to to reach that and exceed it, and I'm grateful for you. Now, as we look at this, uh, the book of Philippians in chapter 2, some people may ask the question, Chris, is this not a weird passage of Scripture in a weird spot in the book of Philippians? And the answer would be, probably. You know, it's a, it is odd. It certainly comes out strange. We've just come to the first part of chapter 2 with this Christological hymn, and in chapter 3, we step into the application and Paul really talking about because of who Christ is, here's how I've lived out, here's what I treasure, here's what I value. And sandwiched right between there is an email he got from Expedia.com on travel plans of Epaphroditus and Timothy and the church at Philippi. It looks odd. Scholars have looked at that and said, I don't know what he was thinking. It doesn't make sense. It seems out of place, yet it's not. In fact... Now, there's no footnotes. I can't like flip to page 171 and see footnote number three. God says, here's why I put that in there. But I can deduce some things and try to come up with, why do you think that's there? And here's what Chris Aiken thinks. By the way, it's worth everything you paid for it at the door. Here's what Chris Aiken thinks. I think this is specifically and intentionally included as a reminder that no one fulfills their God-ordained purpose alone. You can't do it by yourself. You're stuck with one another we're stuck together if you're to fulfill what God created you for you must do it together we must do it together Jody and I recently uh, started watching a series on Disney Plus I just got it I like figured out there's a Disney Plus channel it's amazing I know y'all are like you're so behind the times (laughs) it's the story of my life ask my children 
And, uh, but we just started watching this here. We watched the greatest movie ever. We watched Safety about the greatest football team ever. It's a great recruiting film. If you've not seen it, you should. You'll throw all your other stuff away and I'll go get orange. But anyway, there's this, there's this movie Safety. And then we went to this series called Mandalorian. You've seen it. Some of you have seen it. And Mandalorian is like Star Wars set in Texas. I mean, it's kind of got a Western vibe to it, a sort of a Western feel. You've got a bounty hunter out there who gets his mark and then he traipses across the desert, partner, and starts looking for bad guys and brings them in. He's a, he's a desperado. He's all by himself. He's kind of a, a loner in a way. Occasionally he has to have a partner, but usually likes to be by himself. He's the, he's the quintessential independent kind of guy in what he does. As I've watched that, I've thought, you know, a lot of Christians like the idea of being Mandalorians. Particularly where we're from, they prefer to operate independently of others. Now, not you, of course, not us. I mean, we're here. But I'm talking about everybody else. See, nobody would say that. But when they're in community, they like to keep community about this close. Know my name, know where I am, but don't know everything about me. I don't want you all up in my business. And I don't want to be in your business. Don't tell me everything that's going on. Just kind of, let's just keep it on this level right here. Don't go deep with it. We, that would be uncomfortable for us. We don't want to go, we don't want to get involved in each other this way. Just kind of keep it up here at the surface. If, if, it, if we can't just all be desperados, then this is as close as we want to get. We want to be affiliated, but not necessarily accountable. And I think that's why Paul slips this in to remind us, yes, the Christology that we look at in the first part of the chapter, and yes, the application that you see as it follows, but I want you to remember, you'll never experience this, which is an outworking of this, if you try to do it by yourself. You must do it in partnership. And I think that's what he's trying to let us know here as we look at it. You can't do it alone because, hey, listen, there are no Mandalorian Christians. Furthermore, we'll find out and see today that there's great joy that's available to us and is God's desire for us as it relates to our partnership and relationship with one another if we'll embrace God's design. Let me show it to you. We're in Philippians 2. We're going to begin in verse 19. And let me invite you, if you're able, to stand with me in honor of the reading of the Word of God. Philippians 2 and verse 19. But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of his proven worth. That he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. Therefore, I hope to send him immediately as soon as I see how things go with me. And I trust in the Lord that, my, that I myself also will be coming shortly. But I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier who is also your messenger and minister to my need because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick for indeed he was sick to the point of death but God had mercy on him and not on him only but also on me so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow therefore I have sent him all the more eagerly so that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less concerned about you. Receive him then in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in high regard because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. Paul's right there. And Father, I pray that even in these moments you'd show us, help us to understand and grasp the power and purpose of partnership. And then I pray, God, that uh, recognizing that and the benefit of it, there'd be folks in here today who'd make commitments to partner together. And then, Lord, I pray you'd be glorified in that. Would you teach us what it means that no one goes it alone? And then I pray that uh, as we trust you and we yield to you, that we'd experience the fullness of your plan and purpose for our lives. We ask you that in Jesus' name. Amen 
And amen. Thank you for standing. You be seated. God bless you. Hey, listen, if you're following along or you want to follow along on the notes, so I'm going to show you three observations from this message that's entitled simply, No One Goes It Alone. No One Goes It Alone. Now, if you don't uh, if you don't have the app where you would get that outline or something of that nature, but you still want the notes, you can get that if you'll text the word notes, plural, notes to the number that you see on the screen. We'll send you a link. It'll come directly to your device, and then you can follow along with a little fill-in-the-blank outline there. Or you can go straight up old school, break out some paper and a pencil or some mascara and get after it, all right? You can just follow along. But hey, be warned, I'm three and a half cups of coffee ahead of you today, so I'm going to speak at that speed, all right? Just so you know. Let me show you these three observations I want you to see. The first one being this. I want you to notice with me the varying degrees of partnership. As Paul talks about partnership here he gives it to us expresses it to us in varying degrees now can we just agree with the fact that Paul is one of the toughest and most influential figures that you'll find anywhere in the New Testament Paul uh, went from being a zealous opponent to a persecuted ambassador of the kingdom When when Christ converted him on Damascus Road in Acts chapter 9 Paul went from being a guy who was breathing murders and threats against the brethren with arrest warrants in order to bring them in and and throw them in jail. He went from that to being a a powerful evangelist who God used uh, to suffer persecution, to experience beatings, to endure imprisonment, to experience social resistance. This guy went from being a persecutor to being persecuted. And God used him powerfully to win the lost and to plant churches and to preach Jesus. Yet, Paul, as tough as he was, did not do it alone. And I think that's why he tells us what he does here. Look at verse 19 with me. He says, but I hope, Paul speaking, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly. Now, you can't send Timothy to anybody unless Timothy's there for him to send. So I know Paul had a partner named Timothy. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. If you were to look at these relationships, Paul, who's speaking, also he tells us about Timothy, and then he goes on to tell us about others. And the, one of the ways to understand these varying degrees of relationship might be to look at it graphically as a concentric circles of relationship. You've got Paul here. Paul is who he is. He's right there. He's the church planting, but former persecutor, now persecuted individual. But he says, closest to me is this guy, Timothy. Timothy's here, and Timothy is a, he's a close confidant. He's a, Paul goes on and tells us, he's a kindred spirit of mine. He's one who's, who, when, when, when I cough, he says, excuse me. When I stub my toe, he says, ouch. Uh, we're like socks and shoes. We're tight. We're peanut butter and jelly. He's a kindred spirit of mine. We just go together. We think alike. This is my inner circle closest compatriot. He is my partner. He is my confidant. He's in that inner circle. When Paul describes him, he describes him as a partner in shared proximity and intimacy. But he doesn't stop at that circle. He goes on out to the next circle and introduces us to Epaphroditus. Look at verse 25. Verse 25, he says, I thought it necessary to send you Epaphroditus My brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier who is also your messenger and minister of my need. So you've got Paul and then you got Timothy who's right close to him. And then you got Epaphroditus who, by the way, in his own right, is a pretty strong character in the scriptures. This guy, he was a he was a sent one from the church. Paul said he's worthy of honor because he endured much for the cause of Christ and for the cause of that church and in bringing this gift that lacked fr- that Paul lacked to bring it to them from the Philippian church. He's a great guy. He's present and he's a partner, but he's at a lesser level of intimacy than Timothy. And then Paul's writing to someone. He's not writing to Epaphroditus or Timothy. Those guys are with him. He's writing to the Philippian church. That would make up an outer circle. He's writing to this church right here, which is concerned about Paul. That's why they sent a gift. They're uh, not only concerned about Paul, but they want to be an encouragement to Paul. They're supporters of Paul, I believe, both in prayer and in physical provision. And they're all of these things. They love him, but they lack proximity or intimacy. They know him. They know who he is, but 
they're not close to him physically or geographically or maybe as close emotionally as Timothy and Epaphroditus are, though they care for him. Now, as you look at the circles like this, you may be asking yourself, hey, listen, if I'm putting together a team, which of these guys is most important? Is it the inner circle guy, Timothy, or is it this partner and fellow worker and and, uh, fellow soldier? Or is it these supporters, encouragers that pray for you and sit for me? Which of those is the most important partnership? And the Englewood answer is, yes. They're all important, every single one of them in their own way uniquely, but they all don't fulfill the same role. There are different roles of relationship or partnership. That's who is in Paul's story. But you know who's not there? You don't see a ring for Mandalorian Christians, do you? Well, there's not a ring for individuals. If they were, they wouldn't be in a ring. They'd be out here, you know, riding little motor scooters that hovered across the desert all by themselves out here and and, uh, singing Desperado as they went all by themselves. You also don't see the culture, you don't see... You don't see the city of Philippi or the Philippi government or you don't see the, the Roman. Well, why aren't they partners with Paul? Because they're not going the same direction. They're not even on the same mission. Do you know I've met folks that get discouraged when they find out, you know, the people of our government just aren't for the same thing the churches are. Duh. I mean, honestly, how would you expect them to be? And yet, sometimes people of the faith will despair if they can't get in partnership with them. And to find out the only way you can get in partnership with them is to change the direction you're going and start going the direction they're going. Because you can't, you can't hook two mules to a plow if they're headed north and south opposite from one another. And yet some people say, man, I've got to be, we've got to get the culture on board. No, we've got to change the culture. You can't get the culture on board. It don't like you. But I want to be like Chris. I'm codependent. I need of affirmation. I'm a people pleaser, Chris. And because of that, I've got to get the world to like me. You're going to be really sad for a really, really long time. Because John 15, verse 19, Jesus said, If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world, and I chose you out of the world, catch this now, because of this, the world hates you. You hated person. Some of you, you're just heartbroken now. You just figured it out. You're like, well, I don't want to be hated. I want to make them like me. Maybe if I take them a box of candy or something of that nature. They're not going to like you because of who you're with. Not because of who you are, but because of who you're with. Because of who you're with is the opposite of where they're going. They don't want anything to do with you. Quit trying to make them come be like you and do what you want to do until they get changed. See, these different levels of relationship, there is a church, there is a group of supporters, there is a, uh, someone who's, who's, uh, who's got the vision, but they may not be as intimate. There are intimate relationships, but none of those involve people who are headed the opposite direction. It doesn't mean that we separate from the world or that we ignore the world. It means, though, that we do not delude ourselves into thinking that there is a necessity to partner with the world. You mean we're not supposed to pull out of the world? Paul said that would be goofy. He didn't use those words. Here's the words he used. 1 Corinthians 5 and verses 9 and 10. He said, I wrote in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of the world or with the covetous or the swindlers or with idolaters. For then you'd have to go out of the world. (laughs) Paul said, he said, I want you to hang out with people who are going the wrong direction, but not so you change direction or not deluded that they're going to suddenly go your direction, but that they can become Christ followers. And if their heart gets right, then the direction they go will follow. That's what he said. He said, if you're going to not hang out with immoral people, don't hang out with immoral people who have Jesus bumper stickers. The ones that show up on Sunday morning and say, oh, I'm with him. But on Monday, you couldn't get them to spell Jesus if you gave them the vowels. Are you understanding what I'm saying? He said, that group of people, that's weird. The world doesn't understand that. They wave up. Oh, man, I better watch out. They wave Jesus flags at the wrong time or in the wrong crowd and make folks think Jesus followers do some weird stuff. And he says, you ought to abandon that stuff. Get away from that. 
But don't get away from weird people. Weird people need Jesus. And that's who I've called you to reach. That's the idea. Now listen, the varying degrees of relationship or partnerships seems a bit into it, intuitive to us. You and I look at it and we'll go, well, duh, Chris. I mean, that's pretty obvious. It's obvious what you're saying. I mean, you're, you get the Captain Obvious Award today because you said something that everybody already knows. Why did you take our time with that? Well, before we talk a little bit more about how to relate to them, let's talk about what some of them in those circles look like, some of the qualities. So let me show you that first. Uh, the, so uh, I want you to see not just the varying roles of partnership, but notice with me, secondly, the qualities of good partners. Paul saw fit to describe these guys to us so we could understand some things. Notice how he describes Timothy in the inner circle. Look at verse 20. He says, For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. Paul describes him as a man of the same spirit as him, a man who thinks just like him, who, who gets it, whose heart is moved, whose passions are driven, everything about them. They're in, they're in synchronicity. They're together in all that they do. And he says, Timothy, he has the capacity to have genuine concern for the well-being of others. This guy, is a, he's a man who really understands others, and he doesn't just understand them. He cares about who they are and where they are. He said, we're tight. We're close in that way. And he says, that's different than a lot of other people. He says, verse 21, all the others seek after their own interests and not those of Christ Jesus. In other words, Timothy is one who would pursue Christ's interests even over his own. Notice verse 22, but you know of his proven worth. He says he's got a proven worth, a value that's been tested and has shown itself to bear out, has demonstrated, he's got demonstrated character. He's not merely talk, but he's also walk. That's a, that is so important. And then he goes on and describes him from there. He says, he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. He describes him as loyal and loving and humble and devoted like a child working alongside of or serving his father. When he describes Timothy, one of the key characteristics, he says, this guy has proven himself and therefore he's made it to the inner circle. Do you know, now here's where I, I've got so much to say. I wish the clock would slow down. Here's what he says. He says, sometimes we expect things from people in other circles that are only been proven by people in the inner circle. So, oh, I, pastor, I want to marry Cletus. You do? I do. I want to marry him. Well, why? Well, he's got great ideas. I mean, he's a pretty good fella, I hear. Well, is he, is he taking you out on a date yet? No. Does he treat you good? Not so much. But I believe he's going to change. Well, sure he will. What he's proven is different than what he says. Sometimes we'll want to enter into alliances and let people up close to us who haven't proven that, that they deserve to be up close to us. They haven't proven we can trust them to be up close. We'll even start free sharing with people out in that far circle. And we, they haven't even proven they can keep a secret yet. And then we wonder why our business ends up on Facebook. Are you understanding me? So Timothy is a proven. Paul said you can look at his life. You know his life. You've seen him. You know he's, he's the real deal. In the second circle, there's Epaphroditus. Paul describes him in some other interesting language. Look at verse 25. He said, I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, who they knew, by the way, since they dispatched Epaphroditus to him. And Paul describes him. He says, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier. My brother. That's familial language. He said, man, we're children. Children of the same father. I've been thinking about this. I've talked to several of my siblings this week, and I thought about this just last night. I never got to vote on one of them. I didn't get to vote on any of them. I mean, I talked to my baby brother yesterday, and I thought when I got off the phone with him, you know, my parents never asked me if I wanted him. They didn't ask me what he'd come out. They never even gave me a vote. He just showed up one day, nine years late. And started getting all the attention. Who invited him to the party? My father did. See, you don't get to vote on your brothers and sisters. You get them because your daddy said so. 
Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Sometimes you'll look around at your brother or your sister around you and you'll go, that's not my brother. <laughs> well, then why are you kicking yourself out to family? Because if you're in the family, that's your brother. You don't get to abandon them or act like they don't exist or throw rocks. Well, you might get to throw rocks, but you don't get to throw rocks at them. They're your brother, not because of your choice, but because your dad's choice. You don't like it, get a new dad. But if you've got the dad, then you get the brother, which means you've got a responsibility to them because it's family. He uses familial terms, and then he uses the terms of a fellow worker, someone with a shared commitment to a common objective. He said, this guy catches the vision and the mission, and he presses forward to accomplishing it. And then he describes him as a fellow soldier. Now, there's not much difference between that fellow worker and the fellow soldier, except, hey, I didn't get to vote on my siblings, whether I got them or not. When I joined the Army and became a soldier, I didn't get to vote on nothing. <laughs> Somebody told me what to do all the time. In fact, they told everybody what to do. They told us what we could wear. They told us how we could fix our hair. They told us how much money we could make. They told us when we could go to the doctor, when we couldn't. They told us to go jump in front of that bullet. <laughs> why, 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 why? I don't know if I'm into all of that. You don't get to vote on that. You're a soldier. You follow orders. Here's what he said. Epaphroditus, he's a brother who gets the vision and is working toward that and follows the same commands from the same commander that every one of us do. What a commendation for a guy in the second circle. He says, this guy presses forward to fulfill what the commander's called us to do. And then he changes, not just how Epaphroditus relates to Paul, but how Epaphroditus related to Paul's audience. He speaks of him, he says, and he's your messenger. It's the Greek word apostolos, or where we get the word apostle from or sent one, it's the idea of a missionary. He said, he was your missionary whom you sent to me. He is your messenger and your minister. That word in the original language is where we get the word liturgy from. So in other words, he's someone who feels, fulfills a, a, a need or brings aid as an act of worship to God. You sent him as your minister to worship God by meeting this particular need. Paul said, this guy in the second circle, he's incredible. He is, uh, he's a brother who's got the same boss, follows the same orders, who went where you sent him and did what you and God called him to do. He said, that's a good guy to have in that section. But now he lacked the same intimacy Timothy had. See, he was close. They were tight, but not that tight. He was, a, he was important to be around, but he wasn't marrying tight. He's a good friend, but not a spouse, so to speak. And then, if you go on, he says, that, he says as he describes him, he says this uh, Epaphroditus had empathy and tender concern for others. Look at verses 26 and 27. He says, because he was longing for you. I'm sending him to you because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick to the point of death. But God had mercy on him and not on him only, but also on me so that I'd not have sorrow upon sorrow. There's an interesting word there that you don't want to miss. It says that he was distressed over his concern that the church had for him. He's sick and he's worried or anxious or, here's the word, distressed over what the church, how they feel about him being sick. Now, let me just pause here. It's a nice place for a parenthesis. That's weird to me because I'm a guy. When I get a cold, my circle of concern gets very small. I have a cold. I feel bad. My nose is runny. My head is stuffy. And I don't have covid Jody, bring me some ginger ale. Jody, bring me some crackers. Jody, Jody. I'm just saying what your wife's thinking. So don't, listen, ladies, you don't have to say nothing. Just smile. My world gets really small. Epaphroditus gets sick, a sick unto death. And he's not concerned about his own well-being. He's concerned about other people who are worried about him being sick unto death. He's worried about other people being worried. It's tearing him up. He's the scripture says distress, such a unique word. It's only used three times in the New Testament, this place and two other places. Mark chapter 14, verse uh, 33, and here in Matthew 26, 37. And he says here, 
It says, And he, Jesus, took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. This same word, this word of concern, this word of burden and weightiness of anxiousness, of, of suffering, the heaviness of this is only described in one other place other than Epaphroditus. And it's in Jesus' anxiousness, his distress in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he's in the garden, you know the same night that he sweat great drops of blood, the night that he's about to be kissed by Judas and arrested and beaten, the eve of his crucifixion, he was distressed. Epaphroditus was distressed, same word, same idea. Epaphroditus didn't just feel bad wondering, man, I bless their hearts, they're going to be worried about me. He's grieved because he knows the church is going to be destroyed over him. It speaks of being deeply troubled or despondent. It speaks, if you will, of his concern for the church in their concern for his condition. And then you've got in the outer circle, you've got the Philippian church. Now, the Philippian church, we have to kind of draw from a little bit because Paul's writing to them. Here's what we know about the Philippian church, their characteristics. They were a concerned church. They were concerned with what was going on. They were concerned. They, they were aware. They heard Paul had a need, and they immediately rallied to meet the need. They were concerned. They acted sacrificially. They gave of themselves, gave sacrificially in order for Paul's needs to be met, not only in physical provision, but also in sending one of their leaders, Epaphroditus, to carry it. They sacrificed to meet the need. And then thirdly, they acted, or they actively interceded. Now, that's not explicit in the text. It doesn't say in the church prayed for him. But I'm going to tell you, the church prayed for him. I can look at the context of this and tell you this was a church that prayed for Paul and his way. And God told them, send as a minister and as a, uh, yeah, as a minister of my need, send Epaphroditus to them. And they responded and did that. This church was concerned, they gave, they acted sacrificially, and they actively interceded. Their concerns manifested in intercession. Now, you may be thinking, man, if I had some friends like these guys, there's no telling what I could do. I need to be in some relationships like these. True. And as we look at this final observation, I want you to I want you to see, I think Paul will give us some insights on how we can gain partners like this. So notice with me, first of all, not the varying roles of partnership or the qualities of good partners, but look thirdly at the mutuality of partnership. One of the things that's obvious to me as I read these verses is the mutuality of concern, the mutual nature of concern among the people. Look at verse 19. I hope, Paul says in the Lord Jesus, to send Timothy to you shortly so that I may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. Paul says, I'm discouraged, I'm concerned, and I want Timothy to come to you so he can come back and send word and I'll be encouraged knowing that you're okay. Paul's concerned about the church. Well, why is he concerned? Didn't they already send an offering? Yeah, but it wasn't what they could do for him. It was them that he was concerned with. See, sometimes we'll get involved in relationships, but we get into them for what they can do for us. That's not what Paul says here. He says he was concerned about the church, not for what they could do for him, but for who they were. Man, if we're going to have relationships and partnerships, we've got to be interested in people, not in people's proceeds or what people can do. Do you understand? Now, listen, that's not true in the world. In the world, it's about what can you do for me. But in the in the people of God, in the family of God, in the church of God, it's about the people who do. Paul's concerned for them. So he's going to send Timothy so he can learn of them. That tells us or reminds us, well, look at this statement. It says to us that real partnerships are two-way streets of mutual concern, mutual commitment, and mutual sacrifice. Real partnerships they're two-way streets. They go back and forth of mutual concern, commitment, and sacrifice. Of mutual concern, we're concerned with one another. Commitment, we're committed to helping one another. And sacrifice, we'd give of ourselves for one another. If you just go back and read Acts 2 through 6, you'd see that over and over and over again in the template of the early church. That's what he's called the people of God to be for one another. And that's what real partnerships are. We see that exhibited between Paul and Timothy. We see that concern between the church and Paul. We see that concern between Epaphroditus and Paul. And we see that concern between Epaphroditus and the church. 
Self-interested and self-absorbed people look at relationships through the lens of what can you do for me? But a biblical approach reflects a contrasting perspective. It says, what can I do for you or what can we do together? What can I do for you or what can we do together? Not only is there mutual concern, but there's a demonstrated commitment. Timothy was proven to them. That's what verse 22 was about. You know of his proven worth, how he's proved himself tonight at uh, when you come back for the six o'clock service, one of the things we're going to do this evening, Lord willing, is we're going to ordain three men uh, to deacon ministry. Do you know the number one qualification of those guys? According to the scriptures is that they first been tested and then let to serve. That word testing, proving. It says we've looked at their lives. Their lives are consistent with the gospel. They're consistent with serving God and serving others. They're consistent with that. They've proven themselves. They're not philosophically in. They've actually demonstrated their commitment. Why else would you lay hands on and set a group of people apart that haven't proven they're already there? Now, I've met folks that said, well, once you lay hands on them, they'll grow into the role. Weird. Not true even. Could be true, and unicorns could end up in your deer stand today. But it's probably not going to happen. They must first be proven. That's what he said of Timothy. Paul said, you know his life. You've seen his demonstrated commitment. Without a demonstration of commitment, you've got nowhere to go. It reminds me of this statement. True partnerships must go beyond philosophical agreement to practical engagement. Now again, another Captain Obvious statement. We know that to be true. But a real partnership has to go beyond some status I put on Facebook. It has to go beyond something I said I'm for or against. It's got to have action behind it. Here's an idea. Could you imagine Sally She's coming to marry Cletus. They're going to stand in front of the preacher. It's a nice wedding, organ music, the whole shoot match. And, uh, well, I said Sally's going to marry Cletus, but Cletus couldn't make it. He was busy. So he had his friend Bob step in. Bob standing there with Sally. You got Sally there and Bob there. Bob said, I- I'm, I'm not marrying you today, but now Cletus sent a note. I'm going to read it to you. He said, I do, I will for all my life. Could you imagine if Sally said, yeah, I will too? I'd say Sally's, a, Sally's lost her mind. Sally needs to buy some swamp land, and I'll sell it to her. She's naive. She doesn't get it. She's trying to make a commitment for life to an inner circle relationship, and there's no proof. There's no proof. There's only an intent. I will do this if you'll trust me. I just asked Bob to come and deliver my wishes. You'd never get married like that. You'd never connect like that. And yet people try to do that all the time. Chris, I had a friend and I was going to be partnered with them. We were going to do great things together. And then it just fell apart. I don't know why it fell apart. It fell apart because there was no proven anywhere in the midst of that. None. Chris, that fellow joined the church. <laughs> that fella joined the church and then I never saw him again. He didn't join the church, he joined the church membership. Because you're not part of the church till you've, till you've proven yourself. Till you've proven. Are y'all okay? Chris, I wish the church would prove itself to me. I know. Matter of fact, let's go there. I've had folks that have said to me, oh, Listen, if this is you, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about somebody else who acts a lot like you. <laughs> Chris, I came to a church one time. I went there. I've had this conversation. I'm just changing the names for, to protect the guilty. The, uh, I went to this church one time. I never could build any relationships. Did you have any friends? No. Did you, did you try to make friends? Well, no, not really. I just couldn't feel like I ever found my place. Did you find a place to serve? No. Well, I just don't think they had anywhere that they were going that was worth anything. Were you committed to their mission and vision? Did you know what it was? Were you committed to it? Did you sacrifice to bring it to pass? No, I was just kind of waiting for the feeling, feelings. And I never got it, so I just drifted away. 
Well, you drifted away because you was uncommitted. You never proved anything. You wanted them to prove to you, but you never proved anything. It's a two-way commitment. There'll be folks that'll come into Inglewood this year that'll do a U-turn sometime during the year and go right back out the door and say, I just don't know, I couldn't find my place in that great big old church. Well, yeah, but where did you... Where did you build a relationship? Where did you connect? Where did you introduce yourself to someone? Where did you find a place to serve? Where did you advance? The, where did you do that? Because you know, everybody who serves finds people that they're friends with. Did you know that? It's a 100% thing. It's amazing. Well, I haven't really grown much. Well, how's your connect group membership? I hadn't found a connect group that I really gel with. Have you tried any? No, I'm just waiting to see if I gel. <laughs> That's called congealing. That's not jelling. That's conge- you're j- Fill in the rest of that sermon. Let me move on. Finally, Paul says, among this true partnership, there must be appropriate recognition. Paul affirmed Timothy as a son. He affirmed Epaphroditus as a brother. He affirmed the church as a partner. He told the church that it ought to honor men such as Epaphroditus because they put it all on the line to carry out their mission. Don't take my word. Look at his words, verse 29 and 30. Receive him then in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in high regard because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. Chris, I had a friend and I I gave him honor. I really affirmed him. I tried to help him grow and become, but he never did do any of that stuff. But I really affirmed him. You affirmed somebody who never did it. You understand proving comes before affirmation. Man, there's so many applications of this. We're talking about it like church, but wouldn't this fit in a marriage? Wouldn't this fit in a a co-worker relationship? Wouldn't this fit in an employer relationship? It would fit in all these things. You may ask, well, how do I get a partner like this? I was hoping you'd get to that. The answer is, well, you become a partner like this. How do I get that? I've had folks that have meant if I could just find Mr. Perfect, if you could just be Miss Perfect. Because Mr. Perfect won't show up until you're Miss Perfect. Well, if I could just get to them. They're, they're, a, they're like the unicorns in the deer stand. They're not coming out today. But you become that friend that you want to find. Here's why. Here's the truth of it. Because you can't expect from a partnership what you'll not invest in it. You can't expect from something what you'll not put into it. You can't expect from a partnership what you'll not invest in it man that's true that's true for church that's true for a marriage that's true in every area that I can think of in life well why would I want to go through trouble like that why would I let's just go back to the church because that's easy why would I want to go through the trouble of making friends and getting connected and finding a place why would I want to do those things hey listen Because Jesus created you for more than what you can get by yourself there are no Mandalorian Christians There's only a community. There's only a family. There are only fellow workers and fellow soldiers. There aren't any desperados. There are no Mandalorians. And Jesus said, when we buy into that, when we get into it, we step into the potential, the probability, the opportunity for abundant life. He says, the thief came to destroy you, desperado, but I have come that you might right now have life and have it to the full, that you might have it in abundance. Why go to the trouble? Because Jesus said, I want to give you abundant life, and this is the way. And then he said, the church, the church was declared by Christ. Catch this now. He declared the church to be uh, the bride of Christ. He declared it to be the body of Christ. He declared it to be the powerful brigade of Christ that would march through the gates of hell to rescue the perishing. Those that the devil had in his minions and desired to destroy, but Christ died to save. He said the church could be a part of seeing rescue there, could get to experience the fullness of watching lives change that way. He said, as you and I are called to significance in this way. God's put this church in a city so that the city would be turned upside down for the glory of God. God planted this church here. God put it here so that Rocky Mount would be forever changed by the glory of God and for the glory of God. Did you know that? 
I wonder why Englewood's here. It's here to turn the city on its ear. It's here to change everything. You say, oh, they're not going to like it very much if we change stuff. No, they're not until they get to experience it. Because, man, you don't want Jesus to change your life until you've experienced a changed life in Jesus. And you're like, why didn't you help me get changed earlier? Because Jesus changed everything. It's phenomenal now. Yeah, but Chris, we're not supp we're supposed to let folks live and just go through life and do what they want to do and just not get involved in that. Listen to me very carefully. If you're in this room or if you're in another room, if you're on the outside of Englewood looking in, listen to me for just a second. You may be wondering, I wonder if Englewood wants me to change. Yes. Yes, I do. Yes, we do. We want you to change. I want you to stop living as though you know the best way and to trust that there is one who knows the greatest way, who created you for his purpose and for his glory, and he wants you to change so that he can help you experience a fullness of life, and you can't get it any other way. I want to see you change. I want to see your neighbor change. I want to see your household change. I want to see your, yeah, I want to see your city change. I want to see the region change. I want the state of North Carolina to be flipped on its ear for the glory of God. I want the United States of America be turned upside down for the glory of God. I want it all to change. I want unreached, unengaged people groups to be wiped off the map and for all of them to give praise, honor, and glory to God. And He's called me and He's called you. He's called us to make that happen. And He's empowered us. And He said, if you will do it together in partnership, God can use you to turn the world upside down. Wouldn't be the first time. That's what he said about the New Testament church. He says, these men have turned the world upside down. Praise God if he'd give us a chance to turn the world upside down. I'm hoping every one of you brothers who are members of, the, who are members of law enforcement and members of Englewood, I'm hoping for the day that you're sitting around like Andy and Barney in a jail that's empty, waiting on maybe one bad guy to come in because there's nothing for you to do because everybody's pursuing the will of God. Do you want to be a part of something like that in your life? I just don't think it's possible, Chris. With men, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And he's called you and he's called me. He's called us to be a part of that so we can do it together. If we would. If you're at the outside looking in, man, I want you to know. We don't care so much about what you've done or where you've come from as much as God, who God says you are and where you're going. And if you're looking for a family like that, let us be your family. Because the Father picked you. And because you were willing. And then we'll be fellow workers. Fellow soldiers. Brethren. Brethren for the glory of God as we turn a city upside down. You say, Chris, I, I would love to have a purpose like that in my life, but I've never nailed down the Jesus thing. Good news for you. He's hunted you down and brought you to this spot right now. Not because he hates you, not because he needs anything from you, but because he desires for you that you would experience the fullness of life. And he knows you can't get it any other way than to yield to him. Would you yield to him today? When I first realized in my life that I was in that spot, a pastor explained to me and prayed with me a prayer where I told Jesus, I'm sorry for being a rebel. And I said, I'd follow you. And you know, on that day, he turned my world upside down. And he said, if you'll follow me, we'll turn the world upside down together. If that's your heart's desire today, I'm going to invite you to do that. But there may be a couple of you listening to me who say, Chris, I've been in the building I've been in the church, but the church, it's not really been in me. And God's put his finger on something today. I'm not connected the way I ought to connect. I'm not serving where I ought to serve. I'm not, I've not bought in to the level I need to. And I don't want it to be that way anymore. Starting today, I want to be all in. Is there hope for me? Yeah. Jesus said, come. And he's ready. Would you bow your heads with me?